the, what we call sometimes the get together, the reception, the whatever, how, are you, how, are, how you want to call it, on the terrace of the Adriatico, but it's a dinner. Okay, I've been asked by many people, it's just uh, some kind of a spritz or whatever. No, it's, uh, it's uh, the complete package, liquid and solid. So don't, don't, take, okay. <laughs> don't take any other commitment for the evening. Okay, it's, we are support, but it's at the, at the Adriatico guest house, okay? Not here, not in Galileo. It's down there on the sea, okay? And second short communication, this afternoon at 4 p.m. we will meet here, everybody interested. This is what in the program is just called the discussion session, which basically we are meaning that we are asking the lecturers to be here with us and just be ready to answer questions to whomever wants to ask, okay? So prepare your questions and your, I mean, questions or opinions or topics of discussion, so it will be completely open. I mean, eventually we might end up in the bar taking just a coffee if there is nothing to discuss, but it's a, it's a free moment of, uh, of discussion and, uh, and thing. Okay, so that's it. And so we are ready to start and I'm really very, very happy to, to introduce you uh, Rick Shane from uh, Irvine and uh, one of the most important teachers of my mathematical life. So, <laughs> and he's talking on some geometric properties of space-time. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, well, thank you. Claudio, can, can everyone hear me? The microphone? Uh, yeah, so, um, right, so I'm, I'm gonna give uh, four lectures, um, um, mostly related to um, uh, geometric properties <clears throat> which are connected in some way with, uh, um, with uh, gravitational energy and mass. And so <clears throat> I thank Piot yesterday for giving an introduction to the ADM uh, mass, so I don't have to, um, <clears throat> to repeat that. Um, but I'm going to be interested in, um, so from a physical point of view, there are um, ideas called quasi-local masses, which um, there are many different proposals for quasi-local masses. Uh, and from the geometric side of view, uh, from the geometric point of view, the mathematical point of view, there's the idea of, of comparison theorems and comparing <clears throat> geometry of curved spaces with a flat, not necessarily a flat, but a simple background space like a a uh, Euclidean space or a constant curvature space. And these two ideas are really very similar and, and, and um, uh, there have been some interesting proposals in both directions which um, have been kind of divergent, but I think they're obviously related. And so I'd, I'd like to uh, present kind of both sides of that story and, and um, um, discuss what might be possible um, relations between them. So let me just say that my, my background is, is, uh, is as a mathematician, so I, I did my PhD in um, differential geometry and geometric analysis, and then I got into relativity a few years after I, I, uh, <clears throat> I graduated be because, because of connections with um, uh, of <clears throat> the Einstein equations with uh, geometric problems, in, in particular uh, the positive mass theorem. Um, and then over the years, I've, um, I've um, <clears throat> kind of been a, 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 a wannabe physicist. I, I, I've learned more physics. Um, I always enjoy hearing real physicists speak. But I, I, I do, I think, <clears throat> I've learned some of the language, which is quite different in some cases from uh, <clears throat> mathematical language. And I view general relativity and, <clears throat> and also um, string theory to some extent as a um, very rich source of... Uh, natural uh, differential geometric problems and also some, in some cases ideas for uh, uh, understanding uh, geometric notions. So I think if you're, if you're, um, if you're working as a differential geometer, it, it, would, it's, it would be a very good idea to, uh, to learn um, the, um, the relativistic or the, the geometric physics side of it as well because um, you may be able to do something, something interesting there. Um, okay, and so um, <clears throat> I'm going to begin um, with, so, so actually I'm, I'm giving four lectures. My first two lectures are going to be on, um, um, on, in, on three-dimensional manifolds. So these will, these will for the Einstein equations, be space-like hypersurfaces in, 
in, in space-time, as Piotr discussed yesterday. So you can think of them as initial data sets. Um, and I'm going to be looking, um, and so Piotr wrote down the, um, the uh, constraint equations, which are conditions on, on the initial data. So, so remember, if we, um, if we take initial data for the, <clears throat> the Einstein equation, it consists of a, of a triple a three manifold, a Riemannian metric G, and, uh, and a, a symmetric zero two tensor K, which will be the second fundamental form. So these correspond to the initial position and velocity for the, for the, um, <clears throat> the Einstein equations, the gravitational part of it. Uh, and um, a very important um, constraint on these is, is, arises from the, the set of four constraint equations. And so let me recall those. So this is, these come from the Einstein equations. and um, so in, in, case, in case there are matter fields present in the space-time, then uh, the first one expresses the mass density of the, of the matter field as observed by an observer moving normal to the, uh, the space-like hypersurface in the space-time. And this Piot showed yesterday, or didn't show, but wrote down yesterday, is, is related to the scalar curvature of G. So it's, it's the scalar curvature of G and then plus a quadratic term involving K, and that term is, um, uh, let's see, um, minus the norm of K squared taken with respect to G, um, and then plus the trace. <clears throat> uh, and then the, uh, this is the, the scalar constraint equation and the vector constraint equation, I'll put the eight, also the 8 pi here. Uh, I'll, I'll write it as ji, which is um, <clears throat> the divergence. So it's dj of uh, k um, ij minus trace k gij. <clears throat> okay, so those came from, those are the constraint equations. They come from the, uh, the Gauss and Kadatsi equations or Actually, Piot had a, an, another nice way to motivate the fact that there must be constraints among the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, initial, the initial data. And um, for positive, um, uh, uh, positive energy theorems, it's very important to have the dominant energy condition. And so, and so what that gives us in terms of mu and j, so this is, these, this is a, these are conditions on the matter fields present. And so they say not only is mu positive, but mu should be greater than or equal to the norm of J. So J, as I've written it, is a, is a one form. And this is, again, the norm with respect to the metric. So, so it corresponds to the fact that, um, that the mass density is positive for any, any observer. Um, um, so that's, that's a, a natural condition which is satisfied by, um, by most uh, matter fields that one considers. And in, in, I believe that this condition is absolutely essential for proving positive energy theorems. It's, it's probably, they're probably not true without, without that. And so, um, um, and so um, I'm going to look, in my first two lectures, I'm going to think of a special case. So, so, um, so there's a this is the case. So, so remember, uh, G is the initial position, K is the initial velocity. So it's perfectly reasonable to uh, look at a, um, a um, gravitational field which is initially, uh, initially at rest. So in other words, K equals zero, or actually the same uh, analysis would work even if trace <clears throat> K is zero. Um, so in this case, um, <clears throat> we can forget about the the vector constraint equation, this inequality just says mu is greater than or equal to zero. And if the trace is zero, then um, this being greater than or equal to zero implies uh, that, <clears throat> so let's forget k here is zero, or actually <clears throat> some of the analysis also works when trace k is zero. And so uh, we would be, uh, the constraint equations would tell us that the scalar curvature is non-negative. Okay. And so this is already a, a very challenging geometric problem to understand, to understand three manifolds with non-negative scalar curvature. Um, so <clears throat> it, it is known, so if you look at compact three manifolds uh, and you ask which compact three manifolds have metrics of non-negative scalar curvature, it is, it is actually known, but it's a, quite a hard theorem. It, it ultimately comes out of Ricci flow um, ideas for 
three manifolds, but there, there's, a, there's a lot that can be said by other methods as well. But, but the geometry is much more complicated than the geometry, say, of, <coughs> of three manifolds of positive sectional curvature or even Ricci curvature. So, so in, in, in Riemannian geometry, we, there are different curvature notions, and the scalar curvature is the weakest of those. So this is quite a, it, it's only a, um, uh, a single function constructed from a three metric, which has, um, which has six, six components locally. So, so it's a, it's a um, in principle, quite a weak, uh, weak condition. Okay, and so, um, in fact, it's sort of remarkable that you can say anything about, about uh, about such three manifolds. Um, if you reverse the sign and you ask which three manifolds have metrics of, of negative scalar curvature, the answer is all of them do. So, so there's, there's no obstruction at all to making the scalar curvature more negative. So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very special to, um, <clears throat> to this situation. And, and, and it actually, I, I think, in a certain sense, is the structure of the... the, the, the the results in this area are very much coming from relativity and are related to uh, ideas about <clears throat> um, gravitational mass. And so um, I'm going to motivate three different, um, I'm going to talk about three different settings or three different sort of um, ideas, and I'm going to motivate them from the two-dimensional case. So, so this is, this, this uh, uh, obviously, we went one dimension down, we would get a much simpler problem. So, so I'm going to start motivation with the the case of surfaces, two-dimensional surfaces. And I'm going to look now at the Gauss curvature, Kg, which is non-negative. So this is a much simpler class of, of <coughs> uh, it's a much simpler problem to, to understand these, these manifolds. And um, I want to talk about three different uh, properties of, of, these, um, of these spaces. So, so I'm going to take property one, discuss idea one, which is the case when <clears throat> I have a complete surface which is asymptotically flat. So, so uh, Piot talked a lot about asymptotically flat for um, <clears throat> in n dimensions for n bigger than two, but you can also uh, look at asymptotically flat uh, surfaces. Okay? And so let's say we have an asymptotically flat surface. Well, what would it mean? So it could, it, it, it could mean the curvature falls off to zero at some rate. Now, the thing about surfaces is that the model at infinity, so if, if, um, if uh, the curvature falls off to zero, the model at infinity is, is, is unique up to a finite number of parameters. Um, namely, if, if you think of flat surfaces, then, then um, <clears throat> then all, all you have are the cylinder is a flat surface, non-compact ones, uh, and you have cones. Okay? And so, and so, um, so the uh, idea, so we're going to look at the situation. So the cylinder is a kind of degenerate case. You can think of it as a degenerate cone. So let's, let's look at the situation where um, M outside a compact set <clears throat> looks like a cone. Okay, so what is a cone? Well, it's a... You can draw a cone in R3. That's a, that's a, a flat surface. Or you could draw a complicated cone. So, so this is a, a convex cone, and that, that the cone angle in this case is, is, um, is smaller than, than, um, than 2 pi. So it has smaller angle than the Euclidean cone. And you could take, well, it has a singularity, but you could smooth it out. You could just say, cap it off like that, <clears throat> and then you would get a smooth surface which is asymptotic to the cone. You could make it equal to the cone at infinity if you wanted to and, um, <clears throat> and, and have non-negative curvature. So, so you can have examples like that. And so asymptotically flat uh, surfaces would be, would be surfaces that outside, that near infinity, look like cones. Okay, and so what's a, what's a cone? Well, the, the cones are determined by a cone angle. So a cone in coordinates looks like this, d rho squared plus a squared rho squared d theta squared. Think of rho and theta as polar coordinates uh, in the plane. And a here is a, um, a, here is a, positive, a positive number. And so um, the period of theta is 2 pi. So this, this has cone angle. Uh, this would have cone angle uh, 2 pi times a. <clears throat> okay, and so um, I, I wrote that down because I'm, gonna, I'm going to 
come back to it a little later when I talk about the three-dimensional case. But um, uh, so that so that's 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 uh, that's what cones are, and, and the cones really the cones together with the cylinder are really the only flat non-compact flat uh, uh, exterior uh, regions that you can have, and so they're parametrized by one number, which is the uh, the cone angle. Um, so the cylinder would have cone angle zero, I guess. Um, <clears throat> okay, and so and so what can we say about this question? Well, if if the if the curvature is not negative, then then, uh, and let's assume also, so, so actually, let, let's assume the manifold is simply connected. Pi one of them is, is trivial because actually the only non-simply connected manifold of this type is a cylinder. So, so, uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, there's really no loss of generality in, in assuming it's simply connected. Uh, and then, and then what, is, uh, what can we say about the, uh, the, uh, the relation between this condition, kg non-negative and, and a, and so the, the, the basic fact comes from the gauss bonnet theorem. And that would tell us that if we take a large region, um, if we take some sphere, some large region um, in um, say, say, S sigma, uh, and we, take, we integrate the gauss curvature, then <coughs> assuming we take S sigma also to be simply connected, then this is 2 pi minus the integral over the boundary of S sigma, the oriented boundary of the geodesic curvature, Kg, with respect to arc length. This is the geodesic curvature. Okay, and so in particular, if, if the Gauss curvature is non-negative, this is non-negative. And the, the, when sigma goes to infinity for large sigma uh, out in the cone region, the, the total geodesic curvature is just the, is just the cone angle. So this is the cone angle. So this would be 2 pi times a. <clears throat> if we take cone angle a. And so, and so what this tells us is that this is non-negative, so that implies the cone angle a is less than or equal to, uh, uh, well, a is less than or equal to 1, or the cone angle is less than or equal to 2 pi. OK, and, and moreover, you can see that equality holds uh, only only if k is identically 0. And if k is identically zero, the manifold, <laughs> the surface is isometric to R2. Okay, so, so, um, so, it's, so it's a theorem that tells us that the local condition, that is kg non-negative, has an impact on the asymptotic behavior at infinity. And so, and so what, <laughs> what it says is that assuming kg is everywhere non-negative, then the cone angle in the flat region at infinity must be less than 2 pi. So that's, uh, th that's property one. And, and so, so, the, the, so I'm, I'm stating these for surfaces because each one is going to have a, a generalization to higher dimensions. And I'm going to talk about, so the generalization of this one, of course, will be the positive mass there. Um, OK, so this is, the, this is the first setting. And the second setting I want to consider is, again, the same two-dimensional setting, but where I take now a region, just an arbitrary region, omega smooth, say with smooth boundary contained in M. And again, for simplicity, I'll assume the region simply connected. So in other words, I have my, <clears throat> my surface and I just take some region. Omega in there. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, again, I've written down the gauss bonnet theorem. If I apply, apply the gauss bonnet theorem on omega, then what I get is that the integral of omega of k with respect to the, um, the area element is 2 pi because, the, again, the Euler characteristic is 1 because it's simply connected, and then minus the integral over the boundary of omega of the geodesic curvature. Let me just call it k <clears throat> ds. So I get that from gauss bonnet And again, um, the fact that k is greater than or equal to 0 tells me that that is greater than or equal to zero. Now, um, I want to give a slightly different interpretation of this. So, so um, I want to understand the two pi in the following way. So, so I can think of taking this region omega in my curved manifold and comparing it to a region in R2. So here I have M, and here I have R2. And I want to do it in such a way that, that the boundary geometry is the same. So, well, 
A curve, of course, doesn't have much geometry. The, the two curves are isometric if and only if they have the same length, right? Because I can choose an arc length parameter. So there are many different do such domains, but the simplest one would be a circle. So in other words, I could take this curve, we call it gamma, which is the boundary of omega, and I can isometrically embed it into R2. And the, so the simplest way to embed it would be as a circle, uh, <clears throat> where the circle has uh, length equal to the length of gamma. Okay, and then I can, I can isometrically embed. I just, <clears throat> I just map the circle in there, and I follow around. I, 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 uh, I correspond the arc length parameters. So I move a certain arc length along gamma, and I map that point to uh, a point correspondingly uh, distant along. So I, <clears throat> I would fix one point, which goes to some point, and then when I want to map any other point, I just follow around in, uh, so if this is oriented, sorry, I just um, uh, follow around so that I, I move the, the uh, equidistant along, along, um, <clears throat> along the circle. And then um, what I can do, so, so remember the famous theorem of Hopf for embedded curves in the plane, which is that for any embedded curve in the plane, the, the, uh, the, the winding number or the total change in the tangent is, is uh, total change in the angle of the tangent is 2 pi. Right? So in particular, for any embedded curve, in particular for a circle, um, uh, the, the, the integral of, let me call the curvature of this curve k0, ds is 2 pi. So let's call this curve gamma naught. This is my region omega naught. So I want to compare omega to omega naught. And they have the property that their, boundary, their boundaries are isometric. And I, now, there are many different choices of omega naught in this case. But what I want to then do is I then have a correspondence. I have a map which takes a point here to a point on the circle. Let me call this map, say, phi. And then I can write, and the arc length parameter is the same. So I can write this 2 pi <clears throat> as the integral of k0, where k0 is the curvature. So I can write it as the integral k0, k, k well, really composed with phi minus k ds on gamma. So in other words, I can, <clears throat> I can view the gauss bonnet theorem in this case as giving me <clears throat> a comparison between uh, a domain in my curved surface and a domain, or really a collection of domains in R2. Uh, and then the curvature non-negative condition tells me that this uh, is greater than or equal to zero. So in other words, the, the, the total curvature on the flat space is bigger in general than the total curvature on the curved space. And that's, that's a reflection of the fact that the Gauss curvature is non-negative. Gauss curvature non-negative tends to, tends to make, <clears throat> um, tends to make the, the, um, the rotation number or the, the total curvature smaller than, than it would in the Euclidean case. Okay, and so that's, uh, that's the, second, the second property. And again, I, I write it in this way because it turns out there's an exact analog of this in three dimensions, which I, I want to discuss, which comes from uh, really from physical ideas. And so, and so this is the second case. And then the third is really a special case of this one in two dimensions, but it, it's where um, we take our <clears throat> region omega to have polygonal boundary. <clears throat> so we consider polygons. And I'm just going to, we could do this for any polygon, but let's, let's just take the simplest one, which is a triangle. So I could look at a special kind of region, <clears throat> omega, whose boundary consists of three geodesic arcs, which meet at some angles. So this is my region, we call it T now because it's a, it's a triangle. And so each of these is a geodesic. That means K equals zero. Um, and then if I use the gauss bonnet theorem on this, um, on this, um, uh, for this region, then um, what I get, and so you can see this by sort of smoothing out the edges. So if you remember your undergraduate differential geometry, you can actually get the formula I'm going to write down from the, the one there. 
uh, by, by approximating by smooth domains. In particular, the integral over k of t dA is equal to, so, <clears throat> so let me write down the answer and then I'll, I'll just explain why it, how it comes from that. So, so what it is, if I consider the, uh, the angles of the triangle, the interior angles, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3, then uh, it's the sum theta i, i goes from 1 to 3, and then minus pi. <clears throat> okay, and so let me, let me just explain how that comes from here. So, so the, um, <clears throat> the gauss bonnet theorem, so, so actually the, the curvature contribution, the, when I, so the curvature measures how the, how the tangent vector changes. And so if I'm moving this direction, uh, then uh, the way it changes, the amount it changes at each, uh, at each um, uh, vertex is the exterior angle. So this is the exterior angle, which is, um, let me call it alpha 2. And then similarly here, <clears throat> the exterior angle alpha 3. So if I do this directly, if I put this in, yeah. Uh, expand, okay, yeah. Um, the drawing, or, oh yeah, the, um, right. <clears throat> okay, so let's take a. Okay, so <clears throat> so we have um, let's call this theta one. We have the exterior angle um, alpha one. We have theta two. So we're going this way. Alpha three. So, so actually, the when you smooth out the domain and and, uh, and approximate the the triangular region, uh, this term here becomes uh, becomes the sum of the exterior angles. So, so uh, so you get uh, uh, you get the the integral of k. So from the formula there, you get two pi minus the sum i goes from one to three uh, of the exterior angles alpha i. But now you can see the, 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 the exterior angle plus the interior angle adds up to pi. And so, and so this is equal to uh, 2 pi minus the sum of pi minus the interior angles, theta i. i goes from 1 to 3. And so this is 2 pi minus 3 pi, <clears throat> which, is the, um, which is the minus pi part. And then I get plus the sum of the interior angles. Okay? So that's where that comes from. Um, Okay, and so, and so the, the, the gauss bonnet theorem for these domains with polygonal boundaries uh, give you formulas relating the, <clears throat> the interior or the exterior angles to what they would be in Euclidean space. So in Euclidean space, the sum of the interior angles is pi. And so, and so what this tells us geometrically is that, is that if we take a triangle in uh, a surface with non-negative curvature, then the sum of the interior angles would be always strictly bigger than pi unless, unless k is 0 inside the triangle. Now, now actually, I want to point out that there's, there's actually a much better statement than this, which is true. Uh, and, and again, it's going back to this idea of, of <coughs> constructing um, uh, comparison uh, uh, triangles. So, so actually, what I can do uh, is I can take, so let me call... Uh, so if I look at my triangle here, let me doctor this picture a little, remove the exterior angles. So if I take my triangle in M and I call the side lengths here, say uh, this is L3, L1, L2, then um, I can, because just by the triangle inequality, because, because L because one side length is less than the sum of the other two, I can draw a unique up to congruence triangle in R2. So I can look in R2, and again, I can use this same idea, and I can draw a R2 triangle with the same side lengths. I can draw <clears throat> side length L1, L2, L3. Those have the same side lengths. And then I can look at the corresponding angles. So let me call this one say theta 3 bar, one theta 2 bar, and this one theta 1 bar. So those are the, 
the comparison, so there's, there's a comparison triangle, which is really an isometric embedding of this singular curve, uh, the, triangular, the triangular curve into R2. Okay, and then I have corresponding angles, and there's actually a stronger theorem, which is true, and this is called the Topanaga of Comparison Theorem. And what it says is that each angle is bigger than the corresponding angles. So this is a very important tool in, in, in uh, differential geometry. It says actually not only is the sum of the angles bigger than or equal to pi, but each corresponding angle is larger. So theta i uh, in, the curve, in the curve manifold is bigger than or equal to theta i bar. And again, that's provided k is non-negative. <clears throat> So in other words, triangles in, in surfaces with non-negative curvature are fatter. They have, they have larger angles. <clears throat> All angles are larger than, than <clears throat> the corresponding angles of a comparison triangle in R2. OK, and so those are the three settings that I want to look at. And what we're going to be looking for is uh, generalizations of each, each of these three situations to the three-dimensional case with, uh, uh, with non-negative scalar curvature. And it turns out, remarkably, there are partial generalizations for all of them. And so um, let me also, before I uh, stop, let me make two remarks. So, so um, So first of all, um, <clears throat> So um, the first remark is that um, in, in the triangle comparison theorem, um, it's not really necessary that the, the um, sides of the triangle, that the edges, be geodesics. The comparison theorem would still work in the same way, that this sum is bigger than pi if, so, so to get the sum of theta i <clears throat> greater than or equal to pi, We only need, of course, k greater than or equal to 0 and the, geod and the geodesic curvature of each k, little k greater than or equal to 0 on each edge. OK, and you can see that again from Gauss-Bonnet. So here I wrote the, um, the, the formula. When, when I write Gauss-Bonnet, the, the, the integral of minus k on the boundary comes in. So, so in particular, I get the contribution from the vertices, but I also get the contribution from the edges. And if I assume k is greater than or equal to 0 on the edge, then this is a negative term. And so I could take it to the other side, and I get the, course, the, the, same, sort, the same comparison theorem. So it sort of fits with your idea that, that <clears throat> this is a geodesic. Well, if I moved it out a little bit, then, then that would have k greater than or equal to 0, and that would enlarge the angles. Okay? And so, and so the same is true just under the assumption that <clears throat> k is greater than or equal to 0. I don't really need uh, the, side, the, the edges to be geodesics. That's the one remark. And then the second remark is that um, this, this triangle comparison theorem actually works much, much more generally. So, so, the, um, so Topinagov works whenever, whenever we have sectional curvature inequalities. Topinagov is true for any n greater than or equal to 2, and it, but it requires sectional curvatures. So these are sectional curvatures, <clears throat> bigger than or equal to some kappa, where kappa is a constant. Uh, and then you can, you can make the comparison of, of a triangle in your general space with curvature bounded from below by some constant to corresponding triangles in the space of constant curvature kappa. And so, and so this is really just a very, very special case of a much more general theorem, which is very, very important in, in Riemannian geometry. So the Topinagov theorem has been used to do lots of, <coughs> lots of important things in Riemannian geometry. So it's, it really has a natural n-dimensional extension. But the required curvature condition is much, much stronger than we're, we're assuming. So the sectional curvature condition is a much stronger condition than the scalar curvature being non-negative. Okay. So you couldn't expect triangle comparison theorems for scalar curvature under scalar curvature uh, conditions. Um, OK, so those are a couple of remarks. So those are the three sort of general settings. Are there any questions on this? I'm, I'm going to now move to the three-dimensional case. I assume everybody remembers their undergraduate <clears throat> geometry. 
Um, okay, so, um, so now we're going to consider uh, three manifolds with non-negative scalar curvature. And we're going to ask, in, is there any sense in which, in which these, these kinds of theorems generalize? Okay, and so, and so I can erase this part. Well, so um, Piot already discussed the notion of um, the notion of asymptotically flat in in the higher dimensional case, and so um, in in higher dimensions, one of the main differences is that the the model at infinity, that is the the, the, the question of what <clears throat> what the asymptotic behavior should be at infinity, is is not determined really. There are many many different possible. Uh, asymptotic forms that you might you might assume. In fact, you, you saw that Piot really only required fall off to the Euclidean metric at a relatively weak rate, and so and so it allows it allows rather complicated uh, rather complicated um, asymptotics. On the other hand, if you assume that um, if if we assume that the asymptotic model, that is the model at infinity, is rotationally symmetric. Then there's again a finite parameter family, namely the Schwarzschild metrics. Okay? And so I'm going to look at a special case, and it, it turns out actually to be sufficient to handle this case. But but it's a, it, it's not so hard. But I won't I won't go into it here. So I'm go, only going to consider a special class of asymptotically flat manifolds. So I'm going to be <clears throat> we're going to take the following special case. We're going to take a three manifold now. <clears throat> The metric G, scalar curvature non-negative, and we're going to assume it's asymptotically flat in a rather strong sense. And so, and so this, the, the sense I'm going to assume is I, I'm going to assume that at infinity it's asymptotic to a rotationally symmetric model, which would be a Schwarzschild metric. And in fact, I'm going to make the assumption that G uh, near infinity, so, so outside some compact set, so picture of an asymptotically flat manifold is like this. I have some topology or geometry inside. So actually, in three dimensions, it's, it's no longer true that you should assume the manifold simply connected. There are many, many possible topologies for, uh, for this class of uh, RG non-negative. They, they are restricted in, 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 in a strong way, but there are still lots of, lots of different possibilities. And so, um, so uh, I'm going to assume that outside some compact set, so I cut out some finite set K, then out in this region, uh, near infinity, I'm going to assume the metric is conformally flat. So I'm going to take the special assumption that this is u to the fourth times the Euclidean metric in some coordinates out here. <clears throat> okay, and then and and um, and I'm going to assume the scalar curvature is zero or falls off very quickly. And what that implies is, and I'll talk about conformal deformations of metrics actually in, in the next lecture in more detail. But what that turns out to imply is that u is a harmonic function, or very close to being a harmonic function outside a compact set. So as Piot said for the uh, <clears throat> Newtonian potential, <clears throat> that, um, that forces good asymptotics on, on u. And so, and so what you can prove from the condition that rg is essentially 0 is that u, <clears throat> so of course u has to go to 1, <clears throat> but u is 1 plus a constant, and I'm going to call the constant m over 2. And then there's a, <clears throat> a 1 over r term, and then plus terms that fall off faster. And this first part, <clears throat> 1 plus m over, <clears throat> over 2 uh, mod x, uh, gives us the Schwarzschild metric. So if there were no tail here, then uh, this would be the Schwarzschild metric written in conformally flat form. So the Schwarzschild metric is rotationally symmetric, so you can, <clears throat> you can choose coordinates which, are, uh, which make it conformal to the Euclidean metric. Okay? And, so, and so if you do that, then, then the conformal factor is 1 plus m over 2r, where this m is the Schwarzschild mass that Piot described. OK, so I'm going to make a simplifying assumption that my asymptotically flat metric near infinity uh, is of this special form. And again, you can justify, you can reduce the general case to this by, by, by some methods which are not so complicated, really, but I, I don't want to go into it here. So I, I want to <clears throat> just consider this, uh, this, uh, this class of, um, of metrics. 
Okay, and so, um, and so I want to think of, so in other words, what I'm, what I'm thinking of is replacing the, the cone in the uh, two-dimensional case, which is the unique rotationally symmetric flat metric by the Schwarzschild metric in the three-dimensional case, which is the unique rotationally symmetric scalar flat metric. <clears throat> okay, and so... I've written down the, <clears throat> the basic theorem here, which came directly from gauss bonnet In two dimensions, the corresponding theorem in three dimensions is that um, this is called, this is the first case of the positive mass theorem. In this case, where <clears throat> RG is non negative, uh, what it says is that if the scalar curvature is non negative, then, <clears throat> then the ADM mass M is non negative. Uh, and m equals zero only if <coughs> mg is isometric to R3. Flat R3. So that's the <coughs> first case of the positive mass theorem. And I, I want to explain this in a geometric way, which will lead to a kind of localization. Okay, and so. Uh, so that's my goal here. And so I'm going to explain the proof of the theorem, or a proof of the theorem, um, uh, in the remainder of the lecture today. And I'm going to indicate how it, it uh, leads in quite a natural way to, um, to a, um, a, a local conjecture and, and really a, a family of conjectures which have been verified in some cases. And so. Um, so this is, this is the theorem. So, so again, you should compare it to the, the case of an asymptotically flat surface uh, where the condition that A is less than or equal to 1 corresponds to the positivity of the mass. That's the, that's the idea. So again, it's the same idea that, that <clears throat> the pointwise condition, scalar curvature non-negative, has, has an effect on the asymptotics at infinity. So, so it's, um, uh, it tells us that in fact, you could not, at infinity, have a negative mass Schwarzschild metric, which, which has a filling, uh, which is a smooth manifold of non-negative scalar curvature. So, um, so um, in order to motivate the proof, I'm going to give a, I'm going to give a proof of this theorem. So that's why I wrote down this, this metric here, the cone metric. So. Um, Okay, so we could prove this theorem using the Gauss-Bonnet, but of course Gauss-Bonnet is not going to work in three dimensions. Not, there's no Gauss-Bonnet theorem involving scalar curvature in, in, in 3D. So, so, um, so it's, it, it would be interesting, an interesting challenge to give a different, to give a proof of this which doesn't use Gauss-Bonnet. And I'm going to describe a proof which is actually going to generalize almost verbatim to the three-dimensional case. Okay, and so... <clears throat> What we're going to do, so, so notice um, <clears throat> I've written the cone metric here in a slightly uh, different form, but if, if I want to, I could, I, could, I could write it in conformally flat form. So the first step, so I'm going to prove this theorem. <clears throat> this is the proof n equals 2. And really the same set of ideas is going to work, but it'll be a little more complicated because I'm going to have to <clears throat> replace geodesics by surfaces. Okay, so, so for n equals 2, um, uh, we can give a proof in the following way. We can, first of all, do a change of variables and write the metric in conformal form. So just like we've done here, we've written the, <clears throat> the Schwarzschild metric in conformally flat form. I can rewrite, so this is my metric g, this is g near infinity. I can rewrite <clears throat> g in the following form. I can make a change of variables, and I can write g as I'll, I'll replace r by rho, I can write it as r to the 2 alpha times the Euclidean metric, dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. And it's rather easy to do that because <clears throat> you see how, how do we do that? Well, this metric has to be equal to that. I'm not changing theta, so it has to be true that r to the 2 alpha plus 2 uh, is equal to a squared rho squared. Okay, and since I want everything is positive here, that means <laughs> taking square roots. It tells me that r to the alpha plus 1 is equal to a times rho. <clears throat> 
Okay, and then um, if I differentiate this, uh, <clears throat> if I take d of this, then I get alpha plus 1 dr is equal to a d rho. Um, <clears throat> alpha plus 1 uh, r to the alpha is equal to a d rho. And so if I choose alpha plus 1 equals a, or <clears throat> if you like, alpha is a minus 1, then, <clears throat> then, then these two guys cancel out, and I get <clears throat> r to the alpha. So I get d rho squared is r to the 2 alpha dr squared. So, so it's a simple change of variables. The relation between alpha and a is that alpha is a minus 1. So in particular, when a is less than 1, that means the, the cone angle is less than 2 pi, the alpha is negative. So this is a negative alpha, but that's OK. It's still a complete metric as long as, um, as, long as alpha is bigger than minus 1. So a is positive, so this alpha is between minus 1 and uh, infinity. So those are all complete metrics. They're just different coordinate. They're, they're the conformally flat descriptions of the cone metrics. OK, and now I want to consider uh, something about the geometry of these metrics. So so first of all, I can, I can reintroduce uh, uh, Cartesian coordinates here. And I can write g <clears throat> near infinity as r, which is mod x to the 2 alpha times dx squared, or dx1 squared plus dx2 squared. <clears throat> uh, Euclidean, introducing Euclidean coordinates. Um, I can write the metric in that form. And then, um, and then I want to do the following thing. I want to consider the geometry of lines. So I want to consider the line, say, x2 equals uh, lambda, where lambda is large. And I want to consider x2 equals minus lambda. OK, and, and, and now um, I want to I compute the curvature of these lines. Okay, so there's a useful formula, which I'm, again, this is part of the conformal uh, deformation theory. Um, so there's a conformal formula. I write it down in any dimension. It says if I take a metric g, which is uh, a conformal factor, let's call it b squared times uh, g bar, bar is some other metric. And if I take a hypersurface, so these are, these are surfaces. In general, I can take a, a hypersurface sigma in there. Then um, I, can, I can express the mean curvature, h, of sigma with respect to g in the following form. So there's a simple formula. It's v to the minus 1. This is h bar. That is the mean, the mean curvature with respect to the bar metric. And then there's a term involving a derivative of v. And so that term is n minus 1 times the normal derivative. So let me choose a normal vector here, nu. So I, I take d. d is the derivative. It's just the ordinary directional derivative. There's no metric involved. Nu is the unit normal with respect to g bar. So nu of v over v. OK, so there's a simple formula. Actually, in general, the second fundamental form of a hypersurface, if you can formally change the metric, it, uh, it changes by a, um, by a trace term. Okay? And, and the trace term involves the derivative, the normal derivative of the log of that, that metric. So this is a calculation. Um, so h here is the mean curvature, but when n equals 2, it's just the, it's just the geodesic curvature. Okay? So it's just the, uh, the quantity we're looking at. And, um, and so I want to apply that in this setting. So this is my g bar, which is the Euclidean metric. And I'm going to look at these two surfaces. I'm going to look at a, a line which is pretty high up and a, li and a line which is pretty low down. OK, well, this, this surface is a line. So in particular, h bar or k bar, of course, is 0 because it's, it's just a geodesic in the in the Euclidean metric, so that's zero. So the only the term that comes in here is when I compute k. So, so I can write k. So what I get is k is equal to v. Well, v would be then mod x to the alpha, so it'd be v to the 
uh, the inverse, so x to the minus alpha, and then <clears throat> n is 1, and then I get a minus, and then I get the normal derivative. So the normal derivative is just, so, so again, it depends on which normal. So it turns out the right normal to take is the downward one. So I want to write this as minus this, uh, the, uh, yeah, I want to write this as minus this, and then, and then, uh, divided by v again, so this would be minus 2 alpha, and then I get the ddx2, that becomes a minus ddx2 of uh, mod x to the alpha. V, v is mod x to the alpha, and when I do that calculation, what happens? Well, if I've done it right, this should be positive if alpha is positive, so, so let's assume Let's assume alpha is positive. If alpha were positive, then this would be an increasing function of, uh, <clears throat> of x2. And so I seem to have the sign. I'm, I'm like Piot. I can't get the sign right. Um, let's see. Right. Um, or, oh, OK. There's no minus here. So uh, <clears throat> I had a minus sign because I took the normal to be down. So that's a plus. And mod x to the alpha, it doesn't matter exactly. You can do the calculation. But mod x to the alpha is obviously an increasing function in the x of, of, of each of the coordinates. Right? Mod x is just the square root of x, x1 squared plus x2 squared. Right? And so in particular, this is, uh, this is obviously positive. <clears throat> uh, similarly, if I did the calculation down here, with the upward normal, I would also get that it's positive. K is positive. And so, and so what that means is that the, the, region, the region between those two lines is a convex region. So the, 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 up, both the upper and the lower boundaries are convex. It's a convex region. And so what does it enable me to do? Well, I can look now at geodesics. If I take a point here and a point here, this is on a surface, so I just take two points which are far out <clears throat> in this strip, then I can solve the geodesic equation. Well, I can minimize uh, length, but what could happen? Well, it could happen the geodesic goes far away, but that won't happen if alpha is positive because, because this is convex. So in other words, when I take the least length geodesic, it will lie in the strip, and then I can let the points go to infinity, and I can construct a doubly infinite geodesic. So I can construct a geodesic line called a geodesic line. That's a geodesic which realizes the distance between any two points. OK, so in particular, if alpha were positive, so we're trying to prove, so the, 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 what we're trying to prove is that A is less than 1. That means alpha is negative, right? So the theorem, so, so A is positive. So the theorem here, I, I erased it. So the theorem is that A greater than or equal to 0 implies that A is less than 1, and that means that alpha is negative. And so this tells me that if alpha is positive, the geometry would be such that I can find this slab, so it's the region between two lines, which is in fact convex. And that would give me a geodesic line in here. And it's a, it's a theorem in Riemannian geometry. It, it, it follows, you can, you can prove it from the, um, the, uh, the, the second variation of arc length. But it, it's, a, it, it's a theorem in Riemannian geometry that you cannot have a geodesic line in a manifold with uh, uh, non-negative curvature, even Ricci curvature in, in, in higher dimensions, unless the manifold splits. Okay? So this is a contradiction unless, uh, unless k is 0, but, but k is 0 would, would, would mean that alpha is 0. So, so alpha positive is not possible. So this cannot occur. This is called the splitting theorem. It says that you can't do that. So, so in other words, if, if you have a surface with non-negative curvature, you, won't, you can, of course, minimize distance between any two points. But if you let the points go to infinity, that minimizing geodesic will run away. It will go off. You can never find a doubly infinite <clears throat> uh, uh, minimizing geodesic. And it's. Um, Right, so it uses a theorem. It's actually quite a bit easier in this case. I don't want to belabor the point because I'm 
mainly focusing on the higher dimensional case. But, but, but again, I, I just want to emphasize the strategy. So, so the, the condition, if, if we assumed that our cone angle were bigger than 2 pi, that would correspond to alpha positive. Uh, and the geometry at infinity for alpha positive is such that you have this convex strip. And the convex strip is incompatible with K non-negative because, because you, if you had a convex strip like that, you could construct a, a minimizing geodesic, <clears throat> which is doubly infinite. Okay? And, so, and so that's a proof, that's a proof of the two-dimensional case, which doesn't use the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. And in fact, the proof generalizes almost exactly to three dimensions, uh, except, so, so the main strategy is the, the main um, analog, so let me write a little table here. <clears throat> what's, what's that? Well, right, so, yeah, so this, this would be a slab in R2, except the metric inside here is something we don't know, right? Some K non-negative, yeah. Right. Well, the, me the metric can't be flat because, because alpha is positive, right? Yeah. But of course, it is flat outside. It is flat outside a compact set. But these curves are not geodesics in the. Uh, in, they're geodesics in the flat R2. They're not geodesics in the cone metric. No. In fact, the geodesic curvature is strictly positive. So those, those are not geodesics in the, in, in the metric we have. Um, uh, on the other hand, since, since the region is convex, we can construct a min minimizing uh, geodesics in that region, then we could get this infinite, uh, doubly infinite geodesic, and that contradicts the K non-negative condition, right? <clears throat> so, so basically, the idea is that the, the curvature being non-negative causes geodesics to be unstable. It's just like a, if you take a, a, the equator on a sphere, the, the fact that the sphere is positive curvature means that it's unstable. You can push it off and decrease the length. So it's the same general, kind, general idea. In, in fact, it, it's quite easy to prove, it, but I just didn't, don't want to go through the, uh, the, the argument. But, but again, <clears throat> I just want to emphasize the strategy. So the strategy is the behavior at infinity gives us this region in which we can, we can solve the geodesic problem. And then this doubly infinite geodesic contradicts the assumption that k is non-negative. Because k non-negative tends to make geodesics unstable. So you, you cannot have a doubly infinite. Uh, minimizing geodesic. <clears throat> okay, so that's a that's a proof. Of course, it's you know somewhat more complicated than the Gauss-Bonnet proof, but the Gauss-Bonnet proof proof has no hope of working in higher dimensions. Okay, so I, I want to um, just close today by explaining how these same ideas generalize to three dimensions. In fact, this was the original proof of the um, three-dimensional positive mass theorem in this case. And so there's a, <clears throat> there's a basic uh, table. If we look at n equals 2, n equals 3, then, um, <clears throat> then uh, we're going to generalize curves. So curves in the three dimensions will be surfaces. So instead of looking at geodesics in our three manifold, we're going to look at surfaces. And the curvature uh, of a curve, the Gauss curvature, will generalize to the mean curvature. This is the mean curvature of the surface. Uh, and in particular, k equals zero curves, which are geodesics, <clears throat> will uh, generalize to minimal surfaces. So minimal, minimal surfaces are surfaces of zero mean curvature, and you get them by minimizing area. So if you, if, if, so just like for points on a surface, we take two points, we can connect them by, by a minimizing curve. Uh, if we, uh, in a three manifold, we take a, a closed curve, we can span it with lots of surfaces, and we could look for the surface of least area, which spans it. And that surface will exist in, under reasonable conditions, and, and it will be a minimal surface. That's called the plateau problem. Okay, so, 
So, so the, the, the proofs are really an application of the plateau problem. The idea, the, the geometric condition at infinity is very analogous. In fact, it's precisely the same as this one. And so, and so let me now, so there's a, there's a point. Um, yeah, so um, there are a couple of, so I, so I want to give the proof of, So there are a couple of um, um, points that I, uh, a couple of preliminary points I want to make. And that is, so I, I've taken, as I said, there's not a unique model at infinity. I've taken my metric near infinity to be conformally flat. So, so uh, um, <clears throat> one point is I can do a conformal deformation to make the scalar curvature everywhere positive, we may assume. And again, I'll talk more about conformal deformation later. But actually, there's no loss of generality in assuming the scalar curvature is positive at all points. So that just gets around this issue. So you might have worried here that <clears throat> it might happen that this geodesic lies entirely in the flat region, in the flat part. And, and so then, I mean, <clears throat> the splitting theorem doesn't care whether that happens or not. But, but in the three-dimensional case, that's something we'll have to worry about. So, so we can get around that by assuming the scalar curvature is everywhere positive. So, so if we had a, in order to prove the positive mass theorem, it's actually sufficient to look at metrics which not only have non-negative scalar curvature, but we can make it strictly positive, And it falls off at infinity uh, rapidly. OK, so that's the first point. It's one, one bullet here. OK, and so the proof is going to be the same. So, so how does it generalize? Well, <clears throat> I now have three coordinates. Uh, so my metric g near infinity is u to the fourth times um, <clears throat> dx1 squared plus dx2 squared dx3 squared. OK, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the slab uh, x3 between x3. So I can draw this here. <clears throat> This is say x3 equals lambda, large lambda, and x3 is minus lambda. OK, and then, <clears throat> and, and again, the same reasoning, if, if I assumed if m were negative, so I have, I have the m which occurs in this metric, so my, my um, conformal factor u is 1 plus m over 2r. I'm, I'm trying to show m as positive. So let's first show it's not negative. So if it were negative, we again use the same formula to show that <clears throat> these are mean convex. So if I choose the downward normal, I get that uh, uh, h is positive here. And if I choose the upward normal here, the inward normal, I get h is positive. So, so the, the, the region, the slab, is a mean convex slab. And again, that just follows from putting in plugging in the form of the metric there. Um, so again, h bar is 0. So the v is, v in this case would be u squared. And the point is, if m is negative, then, um, <clears throat> then this function, um, uh, m over 2 mod x, is, is, a, is an increasing function in each coordinate, because m is negative. So 1 over mod x would be decreasing in any coordinate. But since m is negative, that would be increasing. And again, just using the same formula, you can see that if m were negative, you would get a, a slab, which is what's called mean convex. So in other words, the mean curvature points in, uh, top and bottom. And the consequence of that, again, is, is if I choose a curve, so I could take a circle here. The circle could be x1 squared plus x2 squared equals sigma squared, where sigma is large. If I take a, a circle and uh, say x3 equals 0, so that lies out, <clears throat> out in, the, out in the, um, the, um, the exterior region. Uh, and then I don't know what the metric is in here, but it doesn't matter what it is. I can always uh, minimize area. So I construct a surface here. We call it sigma sub sigma, which is a least area surface. And now, because, because, the, because of the, uh, the mean convexity of the uh, region, that surface will remain in the slab. Okay? And then when I let sigma go to infinity, I'll be able to trap that surface, and I'll be able to produce a complete area-minimizing surface in, lying in the slab. 
So, um, so I, in the same way I could produce a, a geodesic line in the two-dimensional case for n equals 2, in three dimensions I'll be able to produce a, a complete area minimizing surface. So I let sigma look at the limit as sigma tends to infinity. Sorry, I'm, I'm writing too small. <clears throat> So I look at these surfaces and I take the limit. Well, I take, as sigma tends to infinity, well, I choose a sequence of these. And I'll be able to get a limiting surface sigma. So these, these minimizing surfaces have a good compactness properties. So you, you can bound the curvature and such things. And so, and so you can, if I look at these surfaces in any compact set, then I'll, I'll get a compact family of surfaces and I can take a, a subsequential limit. And this sigma will be a complete least area surface. OK, and, and moreover, uh, it's, again, there's some, there's some minimal surface um, um, analysis involved in this. But as you might expect, that surface is asymptotic to a plane. It's bounded in height, and so it's, it's, it's asymptotic to a plane. So sigma itself is asymptotically flat. So outside a compact set, the limiting surface is a nice graph, and the, graph, the graphing function goes to a constant, and the derivatives go to zero at, a, at, at an appropriate rate. So we can produce this least area surface, which is uh, asymptotically flat. OK, and then so what? Well. So that, that, has to be, that has to be then measured against the geometry. So the, the geometric condition is that the scalar curvature is non-negative. And so, and so we have to understand sort of the analog of the splitting theorem. Um, we don't really have a splitting theorem for quite in this setting. But um, what we have is, is stability or second variation. So the basic formula, which we'll use <clears throat> we'll use again in later lectures, so let me write it down carefully, is um, if I take, um, if I take a, a, a surface, and this is an n minus 1 dimensional hypersurface in some uh, n-manifold mn, so n here is bigger than or equal to 2, if I take this hypersurface, and if I assume that there's, if I assume that uh, things are oriented, so there's a, there's a normal a choice of a unit normal vector, then um, if, um, if sigma is uh, a stable minimal surface, so what that means is that the mean curvature of sigma is zero, and um, <clears throat> sigma locally minimizes area. In other words, the second variation of area area or volume greater than or equal to zero. So what that means is if I do a small compactly supported perturbation of sigma, so I, I consider a nearby surface, say they agree on the boundary, I consider a family of surfaces. This is sigma equals sigma naught, and I consider sigma t. So I think of varying <clears throat> sigma. Then when I do a variation, I require that the area not go up. In other words, the the uh, sorry, that the area not go down. In other words, it, it, should, it should go up. And that, that's the condition that the surface is a minimizer or a local minimizer. And, and that, that is a geometric condition. So that's, um, that's the, the same as the, um, <clears throat> the analog of the condition that a geodesic be stable, right? So that's a condition involving the, the curvature of the ambient manifold. And so uh, this condition is a condition on... Um, is a condition on the surface which is an eigenvalue condition. It's related to an operator. So let me write this down. So this is a, a somewhat difficult calculation. But um, the condition that the surface be stable is if I consider um, sigma t, I can always parameterize variations by a function times the normal. So I can think of sigma t as the exponential of t times some function phi times the normal vector. So I can think of getting the surface by moving in the normal direction by some 
amount, and, I, and, and so if I, the fee tells me how far I move, positive or negative, uh, 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 how, how I deform my surface. And then the condition that, the, that if I compute the, the area, we call the area sigma t, the condition that d second dt squared uh, at t equals zero is non-negative, turns out to be an eigenvalue condition. It's a quadratic condition in phi. It's an eigenvalue condition on the Jacobi operator. So just as if you're familiar with geodesics, this is just the same, the analog of that. So it's equivalent to the statement that <clears throat> uh, we can write it this way. The integral of, let me write one half over sigma. And this is the scalar curvature of m minus the scalar curvature of sigma and then plus the norm of the second fundamental form. Let me call it k squared with respect to g. So k is the second fundamental form of sigma in m. <clears throat> so this times phi squared, v mu, is less than or equal to the integral of the norm of gradient phi squared. So, on sigma, and this is true for all phi of compact support. So, so a, a function with compact support gives me a way of, gives me a deformation of the surface by moving in the normal direction at speed given by that function times the normal. Uh, and then I can compute how the area changes to second order. Of course, the first derivative of the area is zero because it's minimal. Okay? And so the, the second derivative is a measure, <coughs> is telling you whether or not it's a stable critical point of, of area. And so the condition that it is <clears throat> a stable critical point is the condition that this inequality holds uh, for every f function which is smooth with compact support. Okay. So that's that stability. And you can see the geometry in this. Well, this is a positive term, so you know it's good, a good term. So we, we want to take something like, we want to take simple choices of phi, like phi equals uh, a nice function. If we took phi to be 1, for example, then this would, be, um, this would be a good term. And the scalar curvature is positive. That's the, that's the assumption we're making to begin with. <clears throat> and so uh, what it's telling us is, is that in, in, in some average sense, the scalar curvature of sigma is also positive. So the idea is here, if we think of, say, phi as 1, then it's telling us the average or the integral of r sigma would also be positive. So if, if scalar curvature is positive and we take a stable hypersurface, then it's also positive in some sense. And that, that's the, the basic idea of <clears throat> the way, that's the basic connection between, the, between minimal hypersurfaces and scalar curvature. And again, it just generalizes this, this, this idea for, um, <clears throat> for, um, for geodesics. Okay, so then how does the argument work? Well, um, again, I won't be too totally precise, but um, so we first construct this, this sigma, and the sigma, again, is, is asymptotically flat. So it's asymptotic to, to a plane at infinity, an ordinary um, <clears throat> uh, plane x3 equals some constant. Um, okay, and so what we're going to do in the two-dimensional case is So we have this inequality for all phi of compact support, right? Um, but in two dimensions, so, so step one, step one is um, we can actually take phi to be one. Well, that may sound preposterous because because I, I'm requiring phi to have compact support. But there's a special thing that happens for surfaces. So the surfaces have area that grow, grows quadratically. So you can, you can approximate the function 1 by compactly supported functions where this term goes to 0. Okay, so the, and th this is called, this is a standard but important trick in geometry called the logarithmic cutoff trick. So, so you can, we can construct, we can actually construct a sequence di, which tends to 1 on compact sets. <clears throat> with um, This is something special to two dimensions, so, so this isn't going to generalize to 
higher dimensions, uh, d mu goes to zero. So this is a two-dimensional surface. Right? And so it's because the surface has quadratic area growth. So roughly speaking, um, if you just take a cutoff function, you take a function that's one and then cuts off to zero, then the derivative will be like one over the radius at which you cut off. So, so this will be like a one over r squared, or one over radius squared. Uh, on the other hand, the area of the surface is like, is like r squared, is the radius squared. And so it looks like it's bounded, but you can fiddle with it a little bit and actually make it go to zero. So, so, it's, um, <clears throat> there's, um, so you, you can actually choose compactly supported variations which converge to, uh, to one. And so in particular, you can take phi to be one. So in other words, you can take that to be zero. And so step two then is um, we then just write this down. Well, all, all these functions decay quite quickly, so they're all, they're all integrable functions. Uh, and so we get that the integral over sigma, so let me keep the positive terms on the left. So I, I have scalar curvature of m, that's positive, and then I have the norm of the second fundamental form squared, that's positive. d mu uh, is less than or equal to and then on the right, I get the integral. Well, actually, one half r sigma is the Gauss curvature. So, so the scalar curvature of a surface is two times the Gauss curvature in the usual notation. So this is the integral of k d mu or dA on sigma. So we get that inequality, and now we can apply Gauss Bonnet. Okay, so the claim is, this surface is, so what does this surface look like? What does this integral look like? Well, this would be 2 pi times the Euler characteristic and then minus the limit of the total curvatures. Now, because this surface is, is, is asymptotically planar in a very strong sense, the, the total curvature of the boundary circle goes to 2 pi. So this is 2 pi, in fact, minus 2 pi. <clears throat> and now, the Euler characteristic, we don't know that sigma is simply connected, but the Euler characteristic of any non-compact surface is at most 1. So this is less than or equal to 1, and so this is less than or equal to 0. So, <clears throat> so the total Gauss curvature, because the surface is asymptotic to a plane in a very strong sense, the total Gauss curvature is less than or equal to 0. On the other hand, these are positive terms. This was assumed to be strictly positive, and so that's a contradiction. Okay? And so that's... that's um, that, that's the, the proof of the, the, uh, the positive, that's this a proof of the positive mass theorem. And I'm going to show next time that it's a proof that leads to, in a pretty natural way to a, um, to a kind of polygonal comparison idea, polyhedral comparison idea. And so I'll, we'll talk about that next time. So, uh, so as you can see, the, the positive mass theorem is very geometric. It, it uses, these ideas are all, you know, all um, sort of Riemannian geometric geometric ideas. And so, um, um, so I'll stop there for today. I think I'm out of time. So I'll go a few minutes over. <clears throat>